Welcome to this webinar organized by the International Academy of Human Reproduction on Reproductive Surgery in 2020. Uh, our moderator today will be Professor Schenker. Professor Schenker is president of the International Academy of Human Reproduction, professor of uh, obstetrics and gynecology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, chairman of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Hadassah University Hospital in Jerusalem. His research has involved experimental and clinical studies in endocrinology of human reproduction, development of methods for contraception, and development of technologies in practice of assisted reproduction. He is interested in the ethical aspects of reproduction and gynecology and obstetric practice and has chaired the ethical committee of IFFS and FIGO committee for the study of ethical aspects on human reproduction. I'm pleased to welcome you to the webinar of the International Academy of Human Reproduction. The webinar of our academy will bring interesting insights for our fellows and a large audience who are following our activities. I'd like to introduce you the activities of our academy. The International Academy of Human Reproduction was established in 1974. It is a professional voice for researchers in the area from clinical medicine, biological sciences, medical education, and population sciences. The academy holds is congresses every three years. Publish the series of books on reproductive medicine for clinical practice and promotes exchange among scientists around the world. Our fellows are selected based on singular and significant contribution to the field and they come from all five continents. Our next plan activities is the 19th World Congress of Academy of Human Reproduction that shall take place in Jerusalem in Israel in 2021. And in autumn, an additional Congress, the first time done in the Latin America in Colombia. But we are not sure about it due to the pandemic of corona, uh, coronavirus. As probably everybody knows that we are in a very difficult situation around the world and our hope, the vaccine becomes the hope for hundreds of millions all around the world, desperate to reach a post-COVID-19 area. The search for COVID-19 vaccine has become a global race with imminent investment intellectually, financially, clinically, and laboratory wise. Therefore, we devoted our first webinar to the topic of development of future vaccine. We hope that you will be successful. And it was presented by the, the Governmental Biological Institute in Nesiona in Israel. Before I introduce our first speaker, Professor Lilo Mettler, I like to put a small tribute to our co-founder of the academy, my good friend, Professor Kurt Sem. One of the founders of International Academy, as I mentioned, during 1970, Sem prepared numerous gynecological laparoscopic operation like myomectomies, operactomies, ovarian cyst resection, removal of tubal pregnancy, and later hysterectomies. Serum, Serum performs the first laparoscopic appendectomy, opening the pace for much wider application of endoscopic surgery to surgery. His technique can safely be called the large revolution in the 20th century of surgery. Now let's we introduce our first speaker, Professor Mettler. She is a professor emeritus of the Department of Obstetric of Gynecology, University Clinic, Kiel, Germany. 
her main field of activity are based on endo uh, uh, gynecological endoscopy, endometriosis, and gynecological endocrinology. Professor Mettler is active participating in many societies and organizations. She has written over 1,000 publications, 20 books, and six textbooks. The last three ones in 9, 2017 and 2019 with the Kiel School of Gynecological Endoscopy entitled Practical Manual of Laparoscopy and Hysteroscopic Surgery. Professor Messenger is Executive Director of the International Academy of Human Reproduction and currently Deputy Chair of the Kiel School of Reproductive Medicine. Please, Professor Mettler, present us the topic advances in endoscopic gynecological surgery. Dear colleagues, very welcome in the name of the International Academy. As a successor, one of the successors of Kurzem, it was very nice to hear uh, from Professor Joseph Schenker the introduction of my chairman for 25 years. My dear colleagues, I have no financial relationships to discuss and greet you from Kiel School of Gynecological Endoscopy this time and Reproductive Medicine in Northern Germany on the Baltic. I would like to share with you today technical advances in the field of endoscopic surgery, anatomical clinical understanding of laparoscopic surgical possibilities in 2020, surgical indications, just some of them in the field of human reproduction, and two future aspects. <coughs> Let us start with the technical advances in the field of endoscopic surgery. A small field we are related to but which is of course directed by endocrine connections, nerval connections, lymph connections to our whole body. Uh, Professor Schenker has nicely introduced me as being still active. And uh, it's my pleasure to have written three books in the uh, past three years, one on endometriosis, a very huge one with Springer on hysteroscopy and one uh, on reproductive surgery. <clears throat> we are holding courses within the Academy of Human Reproduction, within our Kiel School of Endoscopic and uh, Reproductive Medicine, um, as everyone and invite and see and webinars are one of our present activities. Let us start to revise basic reproductive surgical techniques, uh, which are all based on our knowledge of anatomy and our surgical skills, serving the needs of our patients. <coughs> when we started with laparoscopic surgery with Kurt Sem in the early 70s, the working po uh, conditions for us surgeons in all fields were not so comfortable. We had to bend down, as you can see Kurt Sem here, or you can see myself here, and we had to look through the small opening of a camera <clears throat> or a lens, and it was very difficult. Things have changed. Meanwhile, in 50 years, we've developed the Kurt Sem Center for Conventional Laparoscopic and Robotic Endoscopic Surgery at our university. We do all kind of surgical procedures and uh, up to uh, five robots that we are having at present time. And it is nice in sitting position, comfortably, ergonomically uh, to do suturing and necessary <clears throat> work on our patients. So in the world when Kurzem started till today, 50 years, uh, endoscopic surgery has really progressed in all fields of medicine. This is our present director of the Kiel School of Endoscopic Surgery, Ibrahim al -Khatut. Well, technical advances had been necessary and are necessary and will carry us in the future. New technologies, <clears throat> Professor Schenker, we have to come to new ethics every time, new skills, new achievements, and we have to see do financial constraints count? What is the impact? Global exchange of knowledge, particularly now in our times of COVID, we see how important it is for the better and the worse for both sides. So let us look into visualization. How has that improved? Miniaturization, molecularization, and computerization. Visualization, we went from one lens with Robert Virchow to lens systems, to surgical endoscopy, to micro uh, surgical procedures, so we've gone from the very little to the very much we can see 
What are we doing with it? With added colors, the near-infrared endoscopy spectrum is promising in oncologic surgery for endometriosis in our field with gynecologists, but as well in general surgery for um, general surgeons if they work on the gallbladder and the liver. The visualization has gone from video stereo endoscopy to video stereo endoscopy with full high definition. And now they say it's like 4K, whatever that technically means, we have to find out. But the vision becomes much better and becomes nearly three dimensional, even without robot uh, addition. We can see not around zero or 30 degrees, 120 degrees with the endocameleon optic, for example. Of course, in other fields, the urology, they can do wonderful things like taking um, ureter stones and kidney stones away. And we learn continuously from each other. Uh, it is possible to show uh, lymph nodes in gynecology, to show in general surgery cancer, suspicious um, substances in the colon, as you can see an example here. The digital transformation has taken us to an inter uh, exchange of our ideas and takes us forward. My second topic is anatomical clinical understanding for laparoscopic possibilities in 2020. Uh, the anatomy are the roots and basics for every abdominal access. Of course, inside, then we have to find our ways around with laparoscopy, laparotomy, vaginal surgery, everything. And we have also possibilities to look with hysteroscopy inside some of the organs, like the uterus. So in a big sailing uh, race that we recently had in Kiel again, not with that many um, boats as last year, but in a smaller version, you have to find your way. That is the same if you cross the abdominal wall to go inside or the thorax wall. You have to see how do I get inside, not to lacerate anything. Uh, how does it look interperitoneally? And we have also the retroperitoneal anatomy, which I would like briefly to discuss with you. Getting into the abdomen, we have to take care of the vessels that we are passing, not to lacerate them, the uh, inferior epigastric vessels, the circumflex ilia vessel, and the epigastric superficial vessels. And if we lacerate them, we have to immediately take care of it. The, while the first incision is in many cases still blind, even visible entries are available, second, third entry is always under vision and we can carefully avoid lacerating vessels. <clears throat> Once inside the abdominal cavity, we open the curtain of the peritoneum and see uh, what our gynecological field of uterus and adnexus is. Understanding the combined uh, supply of blood from the uterine artery coming from the iliac interna and from the ovarian vessels, we know how we can uh, cut the vessels or preserve the vessels. <clears throat> we understand what the pelvic floor is, not to change the anatomical structures of keeping the organs in a correct position. And these structures are very important, for instance, for the sensor surgery. We try not to lacerate them. If we do, we have to repair it. Of course, childbearing in females does already interact a lot with pelvic floor structures, and we have sometimes to reconstruct them. <laughs> Retroperitoneally, it is even more difficult to find your way around. You have uh, the ureters going over the vessels. Everything is covered with peritoneum, and to enter in that area needs a special skill. You have to specially jump in with here, uh, like here, my colleague Ibrahim al Khatut with his kiteboard. So then we can see the external iliac, the internal iliac, the vessels to the rectum, to the uterus, to the bladder. Where is the ureter running? This anatomy becomes a self-understood entity uh, and looks in laparoscopic uh, surgery difficult than in laparotomy, different. So it is important to see the compartments around the bladder, around the uterus, cervix, and around the rectum. It's actually a defined area that we are working in. If we know our way around, we find the vessels that we need to find. We find all the holding structures and we can try preserve the holding structures necessary. We also use anatomical specimen in a good cooperation with anatomy departments, clinical anatomy today, again, 
uh, and we can really find our way from rectum to uterus and bladder in these studies from different angles, understanding how are the nerves running, how are the blood vessels situated, where is the ureter actually really passing the vessels. So seeing that from different sides is a very important reality. We know then where we can find the lymph nodes going over the vessels in cancer cases when we have to take lymph nodes out and uh, we can localize the different bundles of lymph nodes and nerves. So the anatomical knowledge is the prerequisite for our surgery. The pelvic floor itself is a very thin structure and we have to know how to uh, understand the function of it. Now let's go in some surgical indications in our field of human reproduction. And we are going to go in depth with my colleague, uh, Dr. Sh Professor Shara following afterwards by different options of fibroid treatment. In Kiel, we did laparoscopic myomectomy since the early 1970s with a, at that time Röder loops, which we learned to use from the ENT doctors and very simple suturing. And this technology has of course advanced and today myomectomies are done in a certain step of um, <clears throat> injecting a local vasopressin derivative, making a line of coagulation, then cutting either transversal or uh, horizontal, then finding the fibroid. And we are doing an intracapsular myomectomy by traction and counter traction using different energies. Here you see bipolar energy used. Uh, and then we close that wound after careful coagulation of the stems. Uh, with suturing, we can use intra or extracorporeal suturing. And uh, if the cavity has been opened, we have to use a two layer suturing. Uh, we then extract the organ from uh, the abdomen, either by morcellation, using conventional morcellators like the rotocut morcellator, or we are using uh, in bag morcellation. Uh, to be on the safe side, not to get any spread in the direction of um, sarcoma that we have maybe not suspected in the beginning. So this technology of myomectomy has advanced and is uh, within the knowledge of every laparoscopic gynecologist today and is not anymore a problem no matter where those fibroids are situated. The knotting techniques we have learned we use the von Leffer knot or the Röder knot for extra corporal knotting, and we use intercorporal knotting. My second uh, example is uh, to discuss with you challenging management of endometriosis. And there we have the big field that concerns many of us gynecologists of endometrium being spread into the myometrium. We have various classifications like our endoscopic endometriosis classification, the American Fertility Society classification to look into uh, this topic and to see what stage the patients present. This is stage one, this is stage two, this would be stage three with frozen pelvis. And uh, if we have spread endometriosis to other organs, we like in the bowel, we have stage four, then sometimes we have to do bowel resection. Uh, we use this NCN classification to specially classify deep infiltrating endometriosis, where here we do uh, with a circular stapler, a bowel resection, anastomosis. If endometriosis is in the bladder, we have to do a bladder resection, closure of the bladder. If the ureter is affected, we are skeletonizing the ureter, try to preserve it or have to do an end-to-end -end anastomosis. So in the field of endometriosis, the most difficult one to handle actually is deep infiltrating endometriosis, where we go according to a schedule to decide how radical we're operating. Now in the field of human reproduction, we are a bit more interested in endometriosis on the ovary and what we can do to preserve the ovary. Uh, endometriosis is always done in a wait and see strategy and we may apply that in uh, endometriomas uh, be, uh, compared to IVF. Surgical diagnosis and excisional treatment and conservative, mostly medical treatment. So we are between surgery and medicine at the present time, hopefully others to come. We have to decide uh, how to treat, for instance, a 38 year old patient. Her age is three nanogram per ml. She has a three centimeter endometrioma and she wants to get pregnant. So looking at her age alone after taking out such a cyst with a laparoscopic ovarian cystectomy, 
we noticed that maybe her AMH went down from three to two nanograms per ml. That means her outcome to have healthy oocytes to be fertilized is uh, already challenged. We know that endometriosis surgery it does bring a decrease in AMH levels, and that's for deep infiltrating in an endometriosis and for normal ovarian endometriosis. So we should be quite careful in stripping out an endometrioma if the patient wants to get pregnant, because surgical treatment could exert a further detrimental impact on ovarian reserve. So this ovarian uh, cortex we have to handle gently and consider the symptoms of the patient, the size of the cyst, the past medical and surgical history, the age and ovarian reserve, and the wish of the patient to get pregnant. From uh, different societies, we have advices that us see and treats the patient in endometriosis if she has pain. Otherwise, we may observe and wait. So the past medical surgical history is very important because if she's already compromised in her ovarian reaction, we should be very careful. Beware of patients who already show low ovarian reserve. So an endometrioma uh, excision in a case like this with bilateral kissing ovaries has to, to be done, I agree, because here we have a six and a seven centimeter endometrioma, but we have to do it with the most careful procedure that we can do, preserving as much as possible of ovarian tissue in that patient. The pain issue is clear. If the patient has a pain, she's got to be treated first. Now we also have the donor recipient model in endometriosis. Uh, if we take an egg of an egg donor without endometriosis, and put it in an endometriosis patient or in a non-endometriosis patient, there are similar pregnancy rates. However, if we take an egg of an egg donor patient and take it in an egg recipient patient with and without endometriosis, the um, uh, patient has already, by taking the egg from an endometriosis patient, lower implantation rates, lower embryo quality, and lower pregnancy rates. So embryos derived from women with endometriosis have a reduced ability to implant. Many studies have shown that, that endometriosis oocyte retrieval is less compared to tubal factor and unexplained infertility patients treatment. And the rate of embryo arrest in endometriosis patients is higher than in tubal factor and unexplained endometriosis patients in an IVF treatment cycle, for instance. So endometriosis affects both the oocyte quality and quantity of our patients. And we have to be very careful following a scheme of knowledge, what we are doing if the patient is presenting with endometriosis, decide for surgery, conservative therapy, or di direct treatment of IVF first, and then look into endometrioma. This is our book on endometriosis. We published with um, the Stolz Company support, and it's you can download it under this, um, uh, in, from the internet, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, a concise practical guide to current diagnosis and treatment of endometriosis. Now coming into the retroperitoneal area, again, um, stress, let's stress where, how the ureter is running, how we have to preserve the nerves and the lymph nodes in many cases. The ureter can be easily um, found, detected and uh, shown in endometriosis cases. And uh, here we have a patient, um, just show one glimpse maybe, totally um, cooked and baked in situs of um, endometriosis, where we had very carefully prepared and then taken the decision in this patient to do a rectal resection, but we freed the genital organs and uh, she could later on um, conceive. So let me go to hysteroscopy. Hysteroscopy is an art that we are uh, uh, using to look inside the small uterus, to see and diagnose, and sometimes to operate. So we have diagnostic hysteroscopes with operative channels. We have endo C, very easy hysteroscope, so we can just uh, see what's inside. Uh, we have more complicated ones from companies that help us to do mini uh, interventions, and we have operative hysteroscopy. So hysteroscopy is done for many uh, reasons, interabdominal ble uh, interuterine bleedings, suspect suspicious uterine anomalies, uh, confirmation of abnormal test findings, and should not be done in pregnancy, non-cervical uh, uterine cancer cases. 
The principle is to create a clear picture by continuous flow, which allows the physician to control uterine distension. Fluid can be regulated by syringe, pressurized saline, or better by a fluid managing pump. So uh, the optical angles are important. We know that um, congenital uterine anomalies uh, impact, have an impact on infertility in three to 10% of cases. Interuterine lesions are found in 40 to 50% of infertile patients. And uh, that's why I would like to give you some examples. <clears throat> in addition to the uh, inherited Mullerian anomalies, like Okitansky syndrome, hyperplasia, septa, unicornal uterus, biconal uterus, uh, we have, of course, also acquired uterine anomalies, which we have to see and treat from polyps to fibroids to septa and to uh, previously uh, damage that has been done. So prior to every IVF treatment today, even with the best of pretreatment imaging, a diagnostic hysteroscopy is indicated. I'd like to show you a few cases here, an 18 year old patient, which in imaging shows the cat eye phenomenon. Uh, then we found her with a suspicious use of the Delphis with vagina Delphis and could treat her. Another one uh, at vaginal 2D ultrasonography with a speck, a polyp, then we really see it in 3D. And a uterus susceptus, uterus duplex, a longitudinal non obstructive vaginal septum, tubal uh, occlusion. Many times with endometriosis, we find also these malformations. The malformations are an interesting chapter for the gynecologist and should be known by all of us. Now here I'd like to show you a, a septate uterus with a non communicating uterine horn, which is called the Robert's uterus. A 13-year-old patient <clears throat> came with severe pain that came at every uh, cycle that she had the period when by rectal ultrasound, we found that she had that uh, separate uterus. And we did a, a laparoscopy with endometrectomy and per, uh, uh, produced one uterus and the girl had normal periods without pain after that. In a 20-year-old girl um, with ectopic pregnancy suspicion, uh, we indicated a laparoscopy. We found in uh, ultrasound um, these two structures, like looking like an ectopic pregnancy. We were not sure what it could be. It could be uterine malformation. So doing a laparoscopy, we find in the minor pelvis that there are actually two uteri. This is a non-communicated uterine horn in a Robert's uterus, which then in this case, we decided to do a um, um, resection of the uterine horn and a tubectomy on the right side of the patient. Uh, it was a nice uh, surgical procedure to perform as uh, a young girl and uh, with the pains understandable, the ectopic pregnancy suspicion was not ectopic pregnancy, it was pregnancy in the non-communicating uterine horn, one of the anomalies uh, that is just unfortunately there frequently, and we could take that horn out, cut it open, muscular layer, and pregnancy product inside. So with the diagnostic hysteroscope, we see some of the things, with the operative hysteroscope, we do um, other preparations, like in this last patient that I'm showing you, where the outer contour was a Robert's uterus again, and we found a four millimeter thick septum, which we could then resect uh, hysteroscopically. So the combination of laparoscopy and hysteroscopy in the treatment of uterine anomalies is very helpful. Uh, our latest book is Laparoscopic and Hysteroscopic Gynecological Surgery uh, with JP Brothers in India and comprises uh, a look into all these surgical procedures. I was just able to give you a short look into because we have a limited period of time we are uh, able to spend together. Uh, it is of utmost importance that we also look to future aspects. What are we all dreaming about? In reproductive surgery, where we're using um, in a good 80 to 90 percent endoscopic methodologies like laparoscopy and hysteroscopy, we would like to get rid of cables on the floor. We like to have an operation theater where we can every, have everything connected. So a communication and conferencing, uh, documentation, uh, entertainment, integrated uh, monitors where we get, get our ultrasound pictures, our MRI, everything into it. 
and uh, a, a good uh, possibility to interact with colleagues from outside for some discussions with some chiefs while juniors are doing the surgery. This is computerization. In the webinar, we are right on the moment to be able to do that, and some of it would probably continue as a good communication in the future. With all the technologies, however, and I'm sure that uh, Professor Schenka and Professor Jara totally agree with me, it remains mind over machine. The power of human intuition and expertise in the era of computers is still dominating. It is dominating in the era of COVID. It's dominating in human interactions, in friendship, in love, in everything. So we need robotics and their input in our surgery, but we have to keep our mind alert and awake to be able to understand and exercise the best treatment for the wish of the patient and for her wish in the moment. And of course, for her being in the time where she lives and to give her a happy living. Thank you very much for your attention. I enjoyed to be with you this morning. For your extensive review of the potential of endoscopic surgery, which started, once again, I will mention, with the pioneering work of Seb Kurt and you show us what are the potential for our future. Thank you again. Uterine myomas is the most common type of pelvic tumors in women with approximate 70 to 80% lifetime risk. Potential symptoms of uterine fibroids include painful and excessive uterine bleeding, intervents with the everyday life and self-image and impaired fertility. The direct and direct cause of uterine fibroids are substantial for both the healthcare system and the individual patient. Professor Ciara is the person who will us review the topic of fibroid evidence based on, ter on therapies. Professor Ciara is a professor and chair of emeritus of the Department of Obstetric and Gynecology at Northwest University Medical School in Chicago. In re relation to international activities, Dr. Ciara served as the president of the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics, FIGO. And he is, was editor emeritus of the International Journal of Gynecological and Obstetrics. As a World Health Organizer, WHO, he served as the chair of the Scientific and Ethical Review Committees of the Special Program for the Research, Education, the Self Training in Human Reproduction. Professor Ciara is the dep Deputy President of our Academy. Professor Ciara, the floor is for you. Joseph, thank you for that uh, introduction. And hello to all of you who are watching uh, from around the world. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, evidence-based therapies uh, for fibroids. Yes. I have no conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. And I have four objectives today to allow you to appreciate the various surgical and medical therapies for fibroids, to understand the effectiveness of various therapies based on evidence from the literature, uh, to review some new developments in fibroid therapy, and to know how to counsel patients with uterine fibroids. Fibroids are very common, as mentioned by Professor Schenker. Uh, in the United States, two thirds of white women uh, have fibroids at some time in their life, and three fourths of black women uh, have fibroids also. And this is probably true in most countries. And while some patients with fibroids are asymptomatic, many require either medical or surgical therapy. I'd like to uh, make the point at the beginning of this talk that evidence-based studies do not support treating asymptomatic fibroids. 
Now, uterine fibroids are benign monoclonal tumors of smooth muscle taking origin in the uterine myometrium. And as you know, they can occur any place in the uterus. And the location frequently uh, helps in the plan of therapy. Now in 2011, FIGO uh, introduced a classification of uterine fibroids as you see here. Uh, the the intracavitary fibroids shown in orange, the intramural fibroids shown in green, and the subserosal fibroids shown in blue. Now, this classification, unfortunately, has not been terribly useful in clinical practice. And here's a paper from the Mayo Clinic where they actually evaluated the FIGO classification and came to the conclusion that the FIGO classification of fibroids was not consistent across physicians. There were wide variations in staging, and these variations had an impact on the surgical management in over 30% of uh, patients. So it's an interesting classification, but we don't use it a great deal. Now, uh, traditionally, the surgical management of fibroids for generations has been hysterectomy. But in recent years, patients have been asking for other approaches uh, to fibroid therapy. And today we're going to talk about myomectomy, some alternatives to hysterectomy, and uh, two new procedures uh, that are uh, available in certain centers. Hysterectomy is a very common operation. Here are the figures from the United States. Uh, we do over 450,000 of these operations every year, and 90% are for benign disease. And of the 90%, half or 50% are for fibroids. And hysterectomy is the most frequent non-obstetrical major surgical procedures performed by uh, surgeons in our specialty. Of interest, the cost to the healthcare system in the United States is between four and nine billion dollars annually. So it's an important part of our healthcare budget. Now, uh, the alternatives to hysterectomy are myomectomy, uterine artery embolization, MRI guided focused ultrasound, and uh, some new surgical therapies. Myomectomy has been with us, as Professor Mettler mentioned, for a long, long time. It's done to preserve the uterus and to preserve fertility. And whether it's done abdominally or laparoscopically, there's always an increased possibility of uterine rupture during subsequent pregnancy or vaginal delivery. And this seems to be a more common among uh, laparoscopic myomectomies. Now, if we look at the literature, the recurrence rate of myomectomy in three to five years uh, after surgery is 20 to 25%. And the reoperation rate is 10 to 25% in three to five years after surgery. The conversion rate to hysterectomy today is less than 1%, but the morbidity is equal to that of hysterectomy. And in the United States, we have the morcellation issue uh, regarding laparoscopic myomectomy. And why is there a controversy over uh, morcellation? And here is the story. In 2013, Amy Reed, a 40-year-old anesthesiologist in Boston, underwent a laparoscopic hysterectomy with power morcellation for what were thought to be benign uterine fibroids that turned out to be a leiomyosarcoma. Subsequently, her husband, also a physician, contacted the press with the aim of asking the US FDA to ban power morcellation. So here are the statements from the United States FDA on safety of power morcellation. In, in 2014, the first statement discouraged the use of power morcellation. Then they issued a warning. And then in 2017, they reaffirmed their advice against the use of power morcellators for fibroids. And recently, the FDA calls for patients, healthcare providers, and manufacturers to report events associated with laparoscopic morcellators. Such information is critical in helping us learn 
as much as possible about the adverse offense associated with these devices. And so this is not terribly helpful clinically. Now, when we had the FIGO Congress in Rio in 2018, we had a session devoted to uh, power morselation. And at the end of my presentation, I made this statement. I believe that the best approach to laparoscopic surgery for myomectomy and hysterectomy is to rely on surgical judgment with appropriate informed consent. And I believe that that's a reasonable position at the present time. Now, myomectomy for intrauterine fibroids, hysteroscopic myomectomy, is a procedure that is very effective. It's now well established. Uh, it's about 95% effective uh, for submucous and some intramural fibroids. There are relatively few complications with hysteroscopic myomectomy, except for fluid overload. And there are now some new hysteroscopic morselators available to make the uh, procedure more efficient. Uterine artery embolization uh, has been with us since the mid 1990s. It was first introduced for the relief of heavy menstrual bleeding. And um, in my opinion, the, the best indication for uterine artery embolization is heavy menstrual bleeding where it produces relief in 80 to 90% of patients. It also causes a reduction in the size of the fibroids uh, up to 90%, a reduction in uterine size of up to 40%. In most centers, it's done as an outpatient procedure and there are few complications. Occasionally there's a serious one, but in general, uh, it's completed successfully uh, 98 to 100% of the time. Now, though we were interested in looking at uh, outcomes of uh, uterine artery embolization patients, particularly in relation to subsequent surgery. So we established a registry uh, at Northwestern with 27 sites contributing 2,112 patients uh, where we did a three-year follow-up by questionnaire. Uh, as expected, the main symptom scores were improved quality of life scores were improved, but we were really interested in seeing what percentage of patients came to hysterectomy, and that was about 10%. And for myomectomy, up 3%, and for repeat uterine artery embolization, about 2%. So these are figures uh, that uh, are well-documented uh, that can be used to evaluate uh, the effectiveness of uterine artery embolization. Uh, there was a suggestion in our registry of premature ovarian failure in some of the older patients. Now, MRI-guided focused ultrasound for uterine fibroids is an interesting non-invasive technique. Uh, this picture shows a patient lying on uh, the gel uh, with a ultrasound transducer focused on a fibroid uh, in, in the abdomen. And MRI guided focused ultrasound allows uh, the temperature of the treated fibroid to be measured during each sonication. And this allows for complete treatment of the fibroid with minimal injury to surrounding structures. The treatment takes from one to three hours, done on an outpatient basis, and as I mentioned earlier, is non-invasive. Uh, there is minimal discomfort because the process is coagulative necrosis and not ischemic necrosis as in uterine artery embolization. Now this is a picture of a fibroid on the left, perfusion, uh, prior to treatment, and on the right you see there's no uh, perfusion indicating that the fibroid has been completely uh, coagulated. Uh, this technique has been approved for use in the United States since 2004 uh, for symptomatic uterine fibroids, especially uh, fibroids for pressure symptoms that are located on the anterior aspect of the uterus. Several thousand patients have now been treated around the world, uh, in the UK, uh, in Europe, and in China. And fibroids up to 20 centimeters in size have been treated, but the vast majority uh, of, of cases are with much smaller uh, fibroids. 
The process is central coagulative necrosis, which results in shrinkage uh, of the uh, fibroids, as in uterine artery embolization. And 80% of patients that have this technique report improvement. Now, a word about endometrial ablation. Endometrial ablation in general is not a good procedure for patients with abnormal uterine bleeding secondary to fibroids due to the distortion of the uterine cavity. However, in patients with a normal uterine cavity, it is 75% effective in three to five years following uh, the procedure. Now, uh, we've talked about myomectomy, embolization, and guided ultrasound. I'd like to review with you now two new surgical therapies for fibroids. The first one is called the ASCESA system in the United States and it's laparoscopic radiofrequency volumetric thermal ablation, uh, a long title. Uh, but the procedure basically is a laparoscopic procedure with an ultrasound transducer introduced into the abdomen, as you see in the picture on the left. And then uh, the coagulation device is introduced directly into the fibroid and under ultrasound guidance, the fibroid is coagulated, as you see in the lower portion of this slide. When the assessor system was presented to the FDA for licensure, uh, they presented a figure of 81% patients experiencing reduction of bleeding at 12 months with a change in uterine volume of 44% and quality of life scores increased. And subsequent publications have shown this figure of 80% uh, to be quite realistic. Now, here is a study that compares laparoscopic radiofrequency volumetric thermal ablation with traditional laparoscopic myomectomy. It was a randomized prospective longitudinal comparative study with 56 patients, a small number, but nicely divided into two groups. And the conclusion of the authors was that uh, radiofrequency volumetric thermal ablation resulted in the treatment of more fibroids, a significantly shorter hospital stay, and less intraoperative blood loss than laparoscopic myomectomy. So a procedure to be considered. Uh, there is also a procedure now for sonographically guided transcervical ablation of fibroids, and this is called in the United States the Sonata system. It's available in the UK, in Germany, Netherlands, and I think in other countries as well, and it's a hysteroscopic uh, procedure. Sonata includes a high-resolution ultra-compact sonography probe located at the tip of a radio frequency ablation device. It's a, a hysteroscopic uh, instrument in size, and it's designed to image and treat fibroids within the wall of the uterus, those that are shown in green uh, in this diagram. Now to summarize uh, the things that we have said using uh, reports from the literature, abdominal or laparoscopic myomectomy uh, is uh, successful and helpful in 75% of the cases. Hysteroscopic myomectomy, 95%. Uterine artery embolization is effective in 90% of the patients uh, for up to three years. MRI guided focused ultrasound, 80% effective. Endometrial ablation, particularly in patients with a normal uterine cavity, 75% effective. Thermal ablation, 80% effective. Sonata, too new to evaluate. Now, in in terms of the medical management of, of fibroids, this is an important issue at the present time. And um, we have experience with progesterone receptor modulators, uh, particularly eulopristal acetate, and two new uh, preparations, Elagolix and Orion, uh, which is Elagolix plus add back therapy. Now, here's the first paper of importance with eulopristal acetate published by uh, Professor Donay in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012. And they showed that uterine bleeding could be controlled in over 90% of the patients given this medication. And 80% of the patients developed amenorrhea within 10 days of the initiation of therapy. And there was a significant sustained reduction 
in fibroid volume, and the benign endometrial changes resolved uh, at the end of therapy. And subsequently, another paper by Professor Dunay showed that you could give repeated courses of therapy uh, on up to four in number, and fibroids continued to decrease in size, as you see in this graph, from 35% on the left to 65% on the right. However, uh, there is a word of caution. Um, there have been 900,000 estimated patients treated uh, with this medication, but there have been eight reports of serious liver injury in patients treated with esmia, and four have had liver transplants. And there's a lot of discussion as to whether or not these patients had pre-existing liver disease. But nevertheless, the European Medicine Agency, uh, the EMA, has recommended that women stop taking ulipristal acetate and that no woman should initiate ulipristal acetate treatment at this time. And accordingly, all st studies with ulipristal acetate, particularly those in the United States, are now on hold. Now, this is the um, asteroid trial, and this is one set of patients from the Cleveland Clinic of 309 patients that were treated for 12 weeks, and there was a 40% reduction in fibroid size as expected, and the effect was uh, partially sustained during the follow-up period. However, as I mentioned earlier, because of toxicology issues, enrollment in this study has stopped uh, due to the liver problems. Now, Elagolix is a novel, orally administered gonadotropin releasing hormone antagonist. And its mode of action is suppression of FSH and LH like luprolide acetate. And Orion uh, includes elagolix and ADVAC therapy with estradiol and norethindrone acetate and is now on the market and uh, looks promising, but it's too early for us to have much data. One of the things that I should mention is that for abnormal uterine bleeding in patients with a normal uterine cavity, the levonorgestrel IUD has proved to be a wonderful uh, method and it provides short-term therapy and is successful up to 95% of the time. And there have been many studies that have shown this. Uh, for fibroids, ulipristal acetate was successful but is now on hold in Eligolix and Oriahan uh, it's too early to evaluate. So in summary, in appropriate patients who have completed childbearing, hysterectomy remains a good option and is in general 100% effective. Alternative surgical procedures, myomectomy, uterine artery embolization, and MRI-guided focused ultrasound preserve the uterus but are not 100% effective. Medical therapy with progesterone receptor modulators, particularly ulipristal acetate, is no longer advised. In Oriahan, a combination of elagolix with ADVAC therapy is a promising new approach. And in patient counseling, evidence-based surgical and medical options should be presented to the patient, and the patient should be involved <coughs> in the decision-making process. I'd like to thank all of you for watching, and I'd like to thank the International Academy of Human Reproduction for the opportunity uh, to be a part of this webinar. Thank you, Professor Ciara, for the extensive, interesting lecture, and especially showing us the different modalities of the treatment of the most common growth of females. The question still remains what one should advise to his patient, and it very much depends on the experience of the individual physician. Let us now ask, uh, answer questions. Uh, yes. Professor Ciara has been expressed regarding future endometrial function in infertile patients with fibroids treated by UAE. What is your opinion on this concern? Well, for patients with uh, infertility, uh, th there's a lot of discussion uh, uh, and uh, not always unanimity as to uh, either the treatment modality or what to uh, expect from the treatment. 
So this is more, you know, more or less of an individual thing. Uh, and uh, I don't think one can make a uh, unified judgment as we have made for asymptomatic fibroids in patients that are not particularly interested in preserving fertility or in pregnancy. Maybe Lilo can, can add to this because she probably has had experience. Yes, uh, actually we do not advise it to patients that want to get pregnant, uh, period. We, those we exclude and the radiologists also explain again, they cannot guarantee any alterations. Uh, can I go back to the first question from Sally Ennett? Sally Ennett is writing a long story about endometriosis. Uh, you know, it's a personal question. I don't think we answer a personal uh, advice <laughs> to give to the patient. So no, but we, you're, you're right. But we can generally uh, say that we endometriosis... Do it because we don't give advices to patients, okay. potential patients. So but our... we, we, uh, a doctor who's listening, we can say that stage four endometriosis <clears throat> was spreading into lung and bowel of course has to be treated uh, generally. And that is, uh, unfortunately, many doctors do not recognize it. And that, uh, in any case, there is a way and hope for that treatment. Then we I come would, to you. I would like to ask Professor Metter a question. Since yes. the intra, uh, IVF is growing, so most of the reproductive surgery was devoted to mechanical infertility. What you think still is the place of reproductive surgery and how we need to teach the young generation of performing it? Well, I try to bring that out in my lecture. In every stage of the female pelvis, we still have also necessity of reproductive surgery in the age of in vitro fertilization, embryo transfer. As for example, intrauterine anomalies do not allow, allow the implantation of a, a healthy fertilized embryo. Then structures uh, in the myometrium that compromise the endometrium. So if they give a disfiguration, they are meant uh, then any factors from the tube secretion, secretion that interfere with implantation have to be uh, taken out like hydrosalpings. We have a necessity on ovarian cyst surgery if follicles cannot grow. We have a necessity on tubal surgery. If the patient has both tubes, uh, then we think still it's a first step to correct the tubal issue before we say tubes don't function, we go to IVF. So adhesions, many uh, indications are still given for reproductive surgery in my, in my opinion. Okay, thank you very much. The time is still over. So on behalf of the Academy and our board, I would like to thank first to our distinguished speakers, Professor Mettler and, and Professor Ciara. I would also like to thank VT Congresses to organizing the webinar and assessing with the technology connectivity. Special thanks to you, Mrs. Valentina Tonelli and David Genazani. Thank you very much.